So my name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about bedside ultrasound today, specifically looking at the pleura. So um, it used to be that people think that, thought that you couldn't use ultrasound to look at the pleura. The lung is full of air, and air is supposed to be the enemy of ultrasound, um, but it's actually become the probably the most rapid growing uh, application of point of care ultrasound. It's been um, probably invented in the intensive care uh, unit setting, more on that later, and uh, adopted by emergency medicine, uh, internal medicine, and critical care uh, throughout the world. So very exciting applications uh, emerging in point of care sonography of the lung. And we're going to focus on several clinical questions that are going to help us take better care of our patients. The first is, is there a pneumothorax? This is an incredibly exciting and relatively straightforward application of ultrasound. The next is, is there a pericardial effusion? And finally, can we recognize pulmonary edema? And while there are even more applications of ultrasound emerging, like looking for uh, lung consolidation and other uh, things, let's focus on these basics uh, for the purposes of this talk. So pneumothorax very commonly uh, occurring entity in thoracic trauma. Uh, it occurs in 5 or 6% of mechanically ventilated uh, intensive care unit patients. It occurs as a complication of probably too many thoracentesis that are performed and as well as central line placements. And uh, in the trauma bay, which is one of the more important areas where you would try to look for a uh, pneumothorax, up to a third of them are not detected on the initial chest x-ray. So what we're going to do is uh, basically ask one question, is there lung sliding? So we're going to find the pleura and look for the lung to be sliding back and forth. If lung sliding is present, there's no pneumothorax. If there's no lung sliding, the patient likely has a pneumothorax. So it's a relatively straightforward sign. With a lot of literature to back it up, we see um, mostly uh, uh, the in initial literature here is from uh, Daniel Lichtenstein, and uh, this took place in the intensive care unit where he works in France. And comparing chest X-ray and CT scan in uh, hundreds of intensive care unit patients demonstrated excellent test characteristics of thoracic sonography for detecting pneumothorax. It was very uh, soon after picked up by um, surgeons, radiologists, emergency physicians looking at this same entity and whether lung sliding could demonstrate pneumothorax in the trauma bay. And uh, one of the really excellent things to look at for the test characteristics here are the negative predictive values. And study after study after study demonstrates a negative predictive value of 99%. So this is really uh, a very good study for ruling out pneumothorax right at the bedside in the ICU, in the trauma bay, without using radiation, repeatable, and, um, and uh, very uh, convenient in the evaluation of your patients. Some literature on how good the chest X-ray is, um, there's a very poor sensitivity, basically, in a couple of studies of trauma patients. Now, in fairness, this sets up chest X-ray as a straw man. There's not a radiologist in the world that would tell you that the best test for detecting pneumothorax in the trauma bay is a supine portable chest x-ray usually performed by the patient still on the trauma board. So it's not a good test. It's the, it was often the best that we could do, uh, but it's not like you sent the patient to radiology and had them do an inspiratory expiratory film and do a real good assessment for pneumothorax. But we don't have the luxury of being able to do that very frequently um, at the point of care. So chest x-ray portably at the point of care is often not that good to detect pneumothorax. And here's an example of why. We can see a, a, chest ex, a, a CT scan here where there's not only a pneumothorax, there's actually a chest tube in place already where you can see the, the chest tube here and highlighting the area all around the pneumothorax. But notice that as this arrow demonstrates, the lung parenchyma is right up against the chest wall here and lung parenchyma is right up against the chest wall there. So often when you do an uh, portable projection anterior to posterior through a chest wall that looks like this, um, you don't really see a clean um, pneumothorax edge of, uh, liver, of uh, lung parenchyma margin, uh, which is what you would often look for when you uh, look for pneumothorax on portable chest x-ray. So images like this are what makes us a little more um, understanding of why maybe ultrasound uh, is, is better. So how do we perform this? It was initially described um, using um, a probe held in the anterior part of the chest. And if you think about it, the area in a supine patient where air would accumulate in the setting of a pneumothorax is going to be anterior. Um, if you 
patient has really abnormal anatomy, if they've had prior VATS procedures, if they've had pleurodesis, if they've had um, uh, blebs and multiple pneumothoraces in the past or surgical procedures, then it's much more difficult to confidently rule out pneumothorax everywhere. You could basically look at each individual aspect of the chest and say that there's no pneumothorax at that spot, but the lung sliding um, due to adhesions and other factors is going to be a little more difficult. But assuming a patient with normal, healthy lung tissue, uh, assessing whether they have a pneumothorax, if they're supine, just has to do with looking at the most anterior aspect of the lung. So here we see probably somewhere between the second and fourth intercostal space, right around the midclavicular line, and you hold the probe with the probe marker facing up towards the patient's head. Um, some people have described uh, increasing the sensitivity for the exam by looking at additional areas of the lung. You can certainly do that. The idea is you've ruled out pneumothorax in any area that you visualized. Most of the early studies on this demonstrated just an anterior approach. If you move a little bit more lateral, you can also rule out pneumothorax in that area as well. So the anatomy is going to look something like this. We see skin and soft tissue towards the top of the screen, those horizontal white bands. And then we see uh, a little bit of bright white and then shadowing from behind. These are coming from the ribs. And the idea here is we're going to use the ribs as a uh, landmark so we don't mind having the ribs in the shot when usually we try to get rid of them if we're doing any other kind of ultrasound. Just deep to the ribs, we're going to see a thin, horizontal, bright white line. That's the pleura. And it's basically the first couple of millimeters of lung. And since lung is such a bright reflector, given the fact that it contains air, and it's such a huge density change from the soft tissue and skin that we've been seeing so far, it reflects almost all of its energy right back towards the ultrasound transducer, hence creating a bright white line. Often, even in normal patient, you'll see um, a, a beeline, uh, which was also called a lung rocket or a comet tail, and having a couple of these within someone's chest is actually normal. Um, having too many of them uh, could be a sign of pulmonary edema. We'll talk about that later. So this is the basic anatomy. You want to find ribs, uh, and deep to them, you want to find the pleural line. And when the lung is visualized over a few respiratory cycles, you'll see that it slides from side to side. So we can see here skin, sub-Q tissue, the ribs here and rib there, and this bright white line. And what we see is motion to and fro. So moving towards the right, moving towards the left, moving towards the right again, and back to the left. That is lung sliding. It might seem a little subtle at first, but if you let your eye get adjusted to it, it's not too bad. And certainly, in my opinion, at least less subtle than um, looking for the lung edge on a chest x-ray. So now let's look at this image. Same anatomy. Skin, sub -Q tissue, ribs on either side of the image, bright white line on their leading edge, and then dark shadow coming down from this rib and coming down from that rib. We see a bright white line of the pleura. And if you have a look at this rib, and, and, and uh, pleura interface through the entire respiratory cycle, there is no lung sliding. Now, at first it might seem like there is. At first it might seem like you can see the lung going left and right, just like I described in the previous image, but have a look again at the ribs and the pleura. And with respect to the ribs, the pleura is not moving. So what we want to see are two ribs and pleura sliding side to side. And in this particular view, we see the ribs and the pleura moving together. That's just because the patient's alive and they're breathing and there's a little bit of motion happening. But there's not a slide of the pleura back and forth beneath the ribs. So there's a pneumothorax here. So side by side, it's a little bit easier to tell the difference. On the normal side, we see the pleura sliding side to side. And on the abnormal side, pneumothorax side, there's no sliding. The ribs just, uh, the, the lung parenchyma just looks like it's sitting dead in the water. So you can use M mode to significantly enhance your ability to visualize this. <clears throat> we see the same anatomy up top that we've described two times now. Skin, soft tissue, ribs, shadow, rib, shadow, and pleura. With the patient spontaneously breathing or bagging them or having them on the vent, we drop an M mode line straight through the pleura down the center of the screen. And if you remember how M mode works, on the top of the screen, we see <clears throat> flat lines because the skin and subcutaneous tissue don't move very much during respirations. The pleura is a bright white line, and it happens at about one, two and a half centimeters here. 
with a total depth of 3.9, so at about 2.5 centimeters we see the pleura. So about 1, 2.5 centimeters down here we see the bright white line of the pleura again. Beneath the pleura we see graininess, which represents side-to-side -side motion on M mode. So above the pleura, flat lines. It means you're holding the probe steady and the patient's chest wall isn't moving very much. Below the pleura, grainy lines, meaning the lung is sliding back and forth, meaning no pneumothorax. This sign of flat lines on the top, grainy lines on the bottom, has been referred to as waves on the beach, where we would see the smooth waters on the top and the grainy sand below. And this sign is reassuring that the patient has no pneumothorax at that location. In contrast, this M-mode image, again, demonstrating the exact same anatomy, two ribs on either side of the screen, white pleura, brightness about the mid-range of the screen uh, horizontally going across the middle, and above the pleura here, we see pretty flat lines. Below the pleura, pretty flat lines. So above and below actually look pretty similar, and that's a sign that there's a pneumothorax at that location. So let's line up the pleura on the normal side and the abnormal side, and we can really see the difference. The top of the screen is, is really sort of your control strip on this point of care test. The top should always be flat, whether the patient has a pneumothorax or not. That just has to do with how much they're moving and how steady your hand is. So it's the below the pleural line that makes all the difference. If it looks significantly different, if it looks much grainier below the pleural line than it does above, that's normal. If it looks very similar below the pleura as it does above, that's a pneumothorax. So again, here we have the two views blown up, lining up the pleura right next to each other, flat over grainy, normal, flat over flat, pneumothorax. Incredibly sensitive and specific and portable and repeatable and can be performed in a supine patient. So this is a test that if you're not using it now and you're just new to point-of-care ultrasound, this might be one to consider getting your feet wet with. So let's talk about pleural effusion for a moment, another really important application of point-of-care sonography. So we're going to have a look at the right thorax and the left thorax, and again, I'm going to describe a method that can be performed on a supine patient. The power of this is you can take a supine patient and detect very small amounts of fluid. Depending on which author you read, 50 to 100 cc's of fluid, that's about as good as a good radiology department lateral chest x-ray. Um, and a lot of our patients in acute care or critical care environments can't take that kind of x-ray, but you can detect this small amount of fluid. So we're going to hold the probe so that the marker is facing up towards the patient's head. We're going to be roughly in the axillary line, and we're going to be using the liver as a window. On the left side, we're going to be holding the probe towards the patient's head. We may have to oblique it just a tiny bit to uh, avoid the rib shadows. We're going to use the spleen as a window to view the diaphragm, and we want to be around the posterior axillary line. In this particular view, you're going to have the knuckles right at the edge of the bed. This is a very posterior view on the left side. So what we see here is the patient's head is towards this side of the screen. Their feet are over here. Liver tissue is here, and we see the curve of the diaphragm here. Above the curve of the diaphragm towards the head, meaning if we're above the diaphragm towards the head, then we're in the thorax, this is actually just a mirror image artifact. So it's a reflection of liver tissue that we see above the diaphragm. This is normal. It's to be expected. And it's reassuring that there is no fluid at that interface. If there were fluid above the diaphragm, the mirror image artifact would be obliterated. And instead, you would see a black wedge of fluid. So here we see kidney, liver, diaphragm, and above it, amount of fluid there to obliterate the mirror image artifact. And that anechoic area is very specific and sensitive for detecting pleural effusion or hemothorax. Here's another example where in the right upper quadrant we can see the liver, then the diaphragm, and then fluid all around the lung here. And we actually see a bit of the lung tissue, which normally we can't see, and there's two reasons why we can see it. We can see it because we have an enormously good window of totally anechoic fluid, and it's rare that you get a view as good on ultrasound as having a, an organ that's entirely bathed in fluid. And the other thing is the pressure from the fluid has collapsed the lung a little bit, so we're seeing some lung that is not quite as full of air as it normally would be. So here again is a view through the respiratory cycle where on the right side of the screen we see the liver and in the middle of the screen we can see the diaphragm and on the left side of the screen which is towards the patient's head we see all this black anechoic fluid which represents pleural effusion.
So finally, we want to speak a bit about pulmonary edema. This is another emerging application gaining a lot of traction, especially in the ICU and the emergency environments. And this is something that could have a great amount of applicability on a uh, hospital ward as well, looking for signs of pulmonary edema. So we know what it looks like on chest x-ray. And can we do it at the bedside? So Dr. Lichtenstein, again, um, having uh, demonstrated you could look for pneumothorax uh, and pleural effusion and other things with uh, lung ultrasound. Also uh, did some of the first studies looking for pulmonary edema and um, looked for things at that time we were calling them comet tails. These are bright, white reverberation artifacts coming down from the pleura. So his patients that had pulmonary edema had comet tails. None of them didn't have comet tails. His patients with COPD, a couple of them had comet tails, but most of them did not. And similar, the normal patients without COPD or pulmonary edema, most of them did not. So he found the sensitivity was 100%, very high specificity for CHF, looking for these things which, again, at the time were called comet tails. They've since been called lung rockets, um, and uh, now we refer to them as beelines. So if we look at normal lung, now I have a uh, curved array transducer instead of the linear transducers we've been looking at so far. Looking at the lung, we can see these bright white horizontal lines. And these bright white horizontal lines are reflections of the pleura. You will see that they are equidistant from the skin surface down to the pleura. So one length is the first A-line, the second length is another A-line, and another A-line. And this basically only happens when you have normal lung parenchyma. And if there's uh, consolidation or if there's uh, pulmonary edema at that location, these normal reflections of pleura, this artifact, won't occur. So A lines are very reassuring that you're looking at normal lung beneath your transducer. B lines, in contrast, originate from the pleura. They are bright white reverberations that reflect all the way down to the edge of the screen. So when you see these, especially if you see more than three per area of the lung that you're looking at, this is um, a very good sign that you're looking at pulmonary edema. So why does this happen? Well, briefly, on the left side here of the screen, we can see normal alveoli with thin walls. When you have pulmonary edema, um, there is thickening of the interlobular septa. They become edematous, and they reflect sound waves back and forth within them. The sound waves can get trapped a bit. So going back to using light as an analogy, sound waves can bounce back and forth within the walls of the interlobular septa because they're filled with fluid, and, um, and uh, ultrasound travels very well through fluid just like light can get trapped within the confines of a fiber optic cable and bounce back and forth within the walls, but uh, stay within the cable. So these images, by the way, are um, courtesy of uh, VCU's website where they have some great histologic images available. So again, ultrasound beam we see on the top side here. To create A-lines, the ultrasound beam goes through the pleura, interlobular septa. As it reflects back, it causes this ring down artifact causing equidistant curved reflections of the pleura known as A-lines. That happens in normal lung. When the interlobular septa become thickened, they reflect ultrasound energy back and forth within them, between them and the pleura, and that creates reverberations, echoes basically where the machine thinks it's seeing pleura again and again and again and again, and therefore maps it out here on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, maps out the pleura again and again and again and again and again, causing this long beeline comet tail. So here's a real patient, short of breath, tachycardic, tachypnic. Um, their cardiac ultrasound demonstrated poor cardiac contractility. Their IVC was dilated with very little respiratory variation. And the final component to looking at CHF in this patient is visualizing their pleura. So we see here rib, shadow, and another rib and a shadow. And then we see the pleura just beneath it horizontally. And originating from that horizontal pleura, the bright white echogenic pleura, we see all these bright white echogenic lines extending down way towards the edge of the screen as if we were looking at a shimmering curtain moving back and forth. So these are multiple B lines, and that is the pattern of pulmonary edema on ultrasound. In contrast, we see here no B lines. We see the pleura near the top of the screen. We see a reflection of the pleura another reflection, and maybe without too much imagination, we can see at least a third one down there. So this repeating pattern, equidistant from the pleura to the skin, is A-lines. No pulmonary edema, also no consolidation, but that's a talk for another day. Normal lung parenchyma at this location.
One of my favorite studies that looked at this is from my uh, colleague and friend Vicki Noble at uh, Mass General. I not only like the study because she demonstrated very cleanly that uh, the B lines of pulmonary edema could go away, um, but it's also just an excellent use, in my opinion, of graphically demonstrating data. So um, imagine that you um, were uh, going to evaluate a bunch of patients who had extra fluid in their lungs. Maybe a great place to look for those would be in the dialysis unit. So take patients who are above their goal weight because they've uh, retained some fluid because they're due for dialysis, and you scan them right before their dialysis, and you count up the number of uh, beelines that they had throughout their lung fields. So however many they had, whether it was one or a thousand, you start them at 100%. They all start with 100% of their beginning beelines. And then re scan them as they go through dialysis, as they have fluid removed, as their excessive lung water is removed, as their pulmonary edema improves. And what happens to every single one of these patients, all mapped out individually, there's this person and there's that person and there's this person, all of their beelines decreased dramatically. Many went down to zero um, through the course of their normal dialysis. So what, what's interesting about this is it, it's a nice, neat study, sort of shooting fish in a barrel in terms of looking at a bunch of CHF patients or pa patients with CHF physiology all at once and being able to study a high concentration of them. It also, again, demonstrates graphically so nicely what all the data is doing, right? Um, you don't have to have a great understanding of confidence intervals and how whisker plots look. This is, this is every single patient and what happened to their beelines over time. But when you look at the timeline, the longest patient was here for under 300 uh, minutes. So, you know, basically on a span of a little over two hours up to about five hours, we saw B lines dramatically go away, if not totally disappear. That would be much faster than we would see a B-type natriuretic peptide level change, much faster than we would expect a chest X-ray to demonstrate changes. So what this also demonstrates is the potential that thoracic ultrasound and B lines in particular could be used not only to assess for CHF, but to assess for resolution of CHF. It could potentially be used to monitor therapy. It could be used as a goal of, um, of diuresis or, or a goal towards um, inotropy or whatever other uh, therapies are being used for your patient in their acute decompensated heart failure. So again, a, a very interesting study and, uh, and something that I think demonstrates the promise of being able to use point of care sonography uh, to the end of demonstrating whether a patient has pulmonary edema or not. So uh, I've mentioned Daniel Lichtenstein uh, a few times here. There he is, um, very happy because he's holding an ultrasound machine. Not his choice machine, uh, but uh, one, of, uh, one of the older machines we found on a, on a conference together. But uh, this is felt by many people to be the uh, grandfather of point-of-care sonography of the thorax. Uh, he's an intensive care unit uh, physician in Paris, France, and um, demonstrated most recently, aside from over 20 years of uh, contributing to the literature on uh, point of care thoracic sonography, most recently um, described something called the blue protocol. And this is basically uh, lung ultrasound in the setting of evaluating respiratory failure. So pulling all together what we've discussed so far today, I'd like to just talk briefly about the blue protocol. It involves um, looking at just a couple of zones in the lung. We've got the anterior chest wall up to the anterior axillary line, defined here as zone one. From anterior to posterior axillary line is zone two. And you would scan both of those areas, zone one and zone two, on both sides of the chest. If you find uh, B lines, if you find consolidation, if you find some pathology, you've found it and you're done. If you haven't found it, then you would extend the search back to the posterior uh, aspect of the lung, which he terms zone three, which is anything posterior to the posterior axillary line. So it's a relatively straightforward assessment. There's not a lot of rib spaces to remember, not a lot of anatomy or landmarks to worry about. And what we would look for is this. It seems complicated at first, but primarily we're going to look for lung sliding. And the absence of lung sliding overall is generally um, concerning for pneumothorax. We're also going to look for a B profile. The B profile were lots of B lines, lots of lung, rommets, lung rockets, comet tails. That's concerning for pulmonary edema. Um, if there is a consolidation uh, in the lung, that's cons uh, consistent with pneumonia, again, beyond the scope of this talk, but that's another component to thoracic sonography that's worth keeping in mind. And again, um, if we find A-lines but there is um, no lung sliding, uh, very concerning for pneumothorax.
Here in his assessment, he describes um, looking at the veins, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but the idea being if you have a patient who's acutely short of breath, hypoxic, respiratory distress, etc., and they have relatively normal-looking lungs, meaning there's no beelines for pulmonary edema, there's no consolidation, and there's normal lung sliding, meaning there's not a pneumothorax, pulmonary um, embolism should be considered, and a great way to look at that at the bedside is to look for DVT. So again, pulling it all together, you can get pretty good um, assessment of what the possible diagnosis is for your patient who's acutely short of breath. So I would recommend um, any of Dr. Lichtenstein's articles. He has a nice um, review article that was published in Critical Care Medicine in 2007 describing thoracic ultrasound in the critically ill patient. So any further questions on lung ultrasound, on thoracic ultrasound uh, in general, any other kinds of ultrasound questions, uh, or if you're looking for tips, tricks, ultrasound news, uh, or just a way to contact me with any questions, uh, please contact me through the, our website, sinaiem.us. Thank you.